Okay, hello. Uh, we're in week three and then week four, looking at chapter two. And we're looking at culture here, and culture is really important in regards to how we see not only our own uh, country, but in other countries all have culture. And as far as basically what we're going to be doing is looking at culture and society in a changing world. So we're going to see the relationship between the two, society and culture, and then see how that varies a wee bit across the world. And we're also going to look at some of the components of what are the parts of what make up culture. And then next week, we're going to look instead at technology, cultural change, and diversity. And then we're going to look at some of the theories, or the theorists, as you recall. It's like wearing sunglasses with different colors, and each has a different view of the society and world around us. So we're going to look at the theoretical perspectives. And I'll just touch briefly on some of the potential for future and in, in, in culture in the future, what we could consider potential. Now, some of the things you can think about while going through this video would be what part does culture play in shaping people, you and I, and the societal uh, relations that we have with other people and how we participate with them. So what role does culture play in this? You know, what is the essential components of what makes culture culture? So what are the main pieces? And we're going to be doing that stuff today. And then we're going to be looking at also in terms of, well, how does subcultures Countercultures uh, reflect or lecture directly on uh, on society, and what role do they play? And uh, and then lastly, we'll look at a little bit at the sociological uh, perspectives. I want to be able to sort of give an overview of how do the different theorists look at what the role of culture is in society, and that's what we'll do in week four. All right, so let's get on with this. We're going to start with the introduction to what is culture look at some of the parts of what culture is for this week in week three. Good luck and look forward to seeing you next week too. Okay, let's start with a definition of what is culture. Culture is the knowledge, the language, values, customs, and material objects that are passed from one person to the next, often within our own family but not exclusively, and from one generation to the next in the human group or society. So remember, society is a large social grouping that occupies the same geographic territory and is subject to the same political authority and dominant cultural expectations. So culture would be all those things that we sort of bring together and what we makes us say we are part of, you know, a, a cultural norm. So outdoors, winter activities, the Mounties, uh, the celebration of disabilities in some respects, and certainly diversity, hockey, of course, our government, our money is unique, and our flag, all of which are things are cultural expectations or things that we call symbols of culture. Now, culture is a learned phenomenon. It's not biological. It's not something you're born with. Cultural differences between nations and between countries is it's a learned experience, and the process of learning culture is a is a well studied sociological phenomenon. There's another definition we could we could say uh, that the common denominator that makes the actions of an individual intelligible to a group. So when I know when I put my my hand out that it's going to be shaken because that's what our culture says about what that signals. So. Um, it's an important element about what makes us secure and comfortable we, in terms of knowing who we are as a people. Um, in our culture, shelter is a universal type of material culture, having a home. But it comes in a wide variety of shapes and form. Not everybody's homes look the same. We have apartments, we have single home dwellings, we have very, you know, uh, big homes and very... Um, um, well-appointed homes. What might, f for some of the reasons, be um, similarities in the differences you see across cult cultural examples. So all cultures don't define what is good shelter to be the same. And so culture is unique from place to place. So if we look at material and non-material culture and what it is, material culture is all the physical or the tangible creations that any member of a society and group of the society can either make, use, or share. Now, non-material culture by definition is the abstract or the intangible. 
So non-material would be um, our language, our beliefs, values, rules of behavior, the side of the road we drive on, for example, the way we greet people, the gender rules, what it is to be masculine, what it is to be feminine, our laws, the family patterns in marriages or common law or single parented family or any number of groupings that we have in Canada that this has been seen as normal. Our political system, our face, these are all non-material culture. Now under material culture we have what's called technology and this is something that makes each culture unique and difference too. Uh, this is the knowledge that each culture has, the techniques and the tools that they have to make things and to transform whatever resources, wood, metals, food, whatever, into usable forms and the knowledge and the skills required to use them um, after they've been developed. And so each culture has their own developed technology. Now we share a lot of technology in today's world than what we used to, but some technology is very unique to different cultures. Now when we look at some of the kinds of you know material cultures and non-culture and you know we have different ceremonies and how we have weddings and how we express them religiously are unique around cultures it's what makes everyone in terms of their culture different and not the same so when we think about culture we also have to think about symbols um, when we think about symbols, symbols are things that stand for other things. If you think about love, we often associate it with the image of a heart. Not a beating heart, but the shape of a heart. Peace and a dove, hate, the Nazi swastika, um, the emergency of a siren, anger and hostility, we raise the middle finger, we know what that means. We're not saying, hey, I love you. For female, we associate pink, and for males, we associate blue. These are symbolic. Symbols are anything that mean, that's meaningfully represents something else. It can function to produce loyalty or even animosity, love or hate. The key is that there, are, that there may be one symbol, but it could be interpreted by various cultures differently. Media commercials for beer, clothing, cosmetics, and medications depict who their market is and what it is that's desirable about their product. And so you can notice how they choose to use their symbols if you pay attention to it. Now when we also think about culture, we think about language. And there's a set um, of symbols that express ideas that enable people to think and communicate with one another. And this is what we call language. It's symbolic. I mean, if you look at Chinese, if you look at Arabic, if you look at any other language, they are just symbols and these symbols represent things that can be expressed verbally or we can even express them non-verbally. So we have two kinds. We have verbal and non-verbal. I'm going to show you a quick video here. Back in the late 1960s, I was sitting in this very restaurant on the island of Malta talking to my publisher. I drew his attention to the fact that uh, over the other side of the road, there were two men who were gesticulating in a particular way. The way they were holding their palms to one side was fascinating me. And he said, you know, you look at people the way that a bird watcher looks at birds. And I said, yeah, I suppose you could call me a man watcher. As soon as I said it, it was as if I'd fired a starting gun on a major new project. One that was to engross me for many years to come and take me to over 60 different countries. It was wildly ambitious, but I decided to make a complete classification of all human actions, gestures, postures, expressions, all over the world. And this is going to take a very long time. I was going to do for actions what dictionary makers had done for words. I began making huge charts, naming every facial expression, every gesticulation, every movement, every posture. I kept at it for month after month. And eight years later, I'd completed the work and was able at last to introduce people to the fascinating subject of human body language. One of the first problems I encountered was that even the simplest human action, such as the handshake, has countless variations. Sometimes it's reduced to a mere palm touch, 
as with these Maasai elders in East Africa. But in other countries it becomes more elaborate. In Mali, in West Africa, the handshaker briefly touches his own forearm as the palms clasp. In Morocco, the handshakers kiss one another's hands at the same time as clasping them. And in Turkey, these Kurdish farmers have taken this simple action and converted it into what amounts to a minor ritual. It's the local rule that they can't start bargaining until they're shaking hands. And they have to keep on doing so until the deal is struck. The essential feature of handshaking is that it's an egalitarian act. Regardless of their social standing, the two people involved are momentarily performing identical actions. This meeting as equals that has spread around the world is comparatively recent. In earlier times, when greeting, it was common for the less important individuals to literally lower themselves as a sign of respect. In some remote parts of the world, we can still see this even today. The Toda people of South India still perform this body-lowering ritual with high-status feet placed on low-status heads. Despite their variations, all these greetings have one thing in common. They're all fine-tuned to the precise context in which they occur. So many gestures have different meanings in different places. You have to be quite careful how you use your hands when you're in a marketplace in a foreign country. Now, to me, this means everything's fine, okay. But if I happen to be in the south of France, it would have a quite different meaning. There, the ring shape made by the hand symbolizes a naught or a zero. So in the south of France this means zero or worthless. So you don't want to say the wine was great because in fact you're saying the wine was worthless. It gets even worse if you go to Sardinia because there the same gesture is an obscenity with the ring shape symbolizing an orifice. And if you think you're going to say that something is great in Sardinia like this, believe me, you'll be in trouble. There's another way that you can make mistakes with gestures as you move from place to place because a single message is given in a different way in different countries. The crazy sign. How do you say to somebody, you're crazy? Well, here in Rome, you do this. But uh, in England, I would probably do this, the temple screw, saying he's got a screw loose. Or I might say his brain is going round and round. Or I might uh, tap my head, saying, what's he think he's got inside his skull? In some countries, you do it with two hands. It varies from place to place. and. Uh, if you go to Japan, you have to be careful because if you do it this way, it means he's intelligent. You have to do it in an anti-clockwise direction in Japan if you want to say that somebody is crazy. So all over the world, the same message is given in a slightly different way. One of the most obvious examples of this, and one of the most dangerous, is the insult gesture. This Turkish pedestrian displays his anger with the thrust of a stiff forearm, using his arm symbolically as an aggressively erect penis. A slightly more obscure insult is the cornuta, or horn sign, frequently seen in Italy. It implies that the victim of the insult is a cuckold, that his wife is unfaithful to him. In North America, the most common insult is the middle finger jerk, employing the index finger as a symbolic penis. This is an ancient Roman gesture and is well known in many countries. Much more localized is the Greek mutsa. This dates back to Byzantine times and symbolizes excrement being pushed into the victim's face. In Britain, the main insult is a two-fingered gesture, which dates back to the Battle of Agincourt. It's a gesture that foreigners sometimes confuse with the V for victory sign, but that's performed with the hand the other way around. So when we think about components of culture, we can also include values. Values are very important in distinguishing one culture from another. These are collective ideas about what is right or wrong, 
good or bad, desirable, undesirable in a particular culture. This could include things like health, you know, good health, intelligence, knowledge, freedom. Commonly held values hold societies together as well as set them apart. Now some of the elements of values that they are criteria, criteria by which we evaluate others and objects and events. They're often in pairs of opposites like good and bad, brave and cowardly, hardworking and lazy, and they are very general in orientation. Now when you think about values we can consider that there are some core Canadian values and these were from 2009 and these are core Canadian values that as a society in Canada we value these as important what distinguishes us as Canadians. Now when we carry on with um, components of culture we can look at a number of things. Now we can include in this norms. Norms are established rules of behavior. These are standards of conduct. Now this could be for example um, um, how we interact with one another, how we greet one another, you know, how we drive our cars on the right side of the road and it becomes very important in terms of our typical behavior. Now when we look at our norms there are both you know formal norms and informal norms. Formal are written down as laws and you know when you break the law you get a fine. So these norms are formal the informal or unwritten standards of behavior are understood by people who share a common identity. Um, smoking, we don't necessarily value it as much as we maybe at once did, so to not smoke, we value not smoking, good health and politeness. The norm is now becoming where to smoke or smoking etiquette. Uh, marriage is a value that we have in Canadian society, even though we have a high rate of divorce and a high rate of second marriages um, indicate that we value marriage and people still um, favor marriage as a family style or family um, form. The norm tells us how to be a good husband or how to be a good wife. So for um, these laws or these norms are enforced by sanctions and they can be rewarded um, for appropriate behavior and punished for inappropriate behavior. Now if we carry on some of these examples in terms of what else is there, there are folkways, mores and laws. So folkways are these informal norms of everyday customs that may be violated without serious consequences within a particular culture. So for example, a folk way of brushing your teeth is kind of something we expect people to do. And if you didn't brush your teeth, as though it wouldn't be very pleasant, it, there's no law that says you have to. It's a folk way. It's an informal norm. There's a sort of generalized understanding that good hygiene is valued. The kinds of clothing that we wear. I don't wear uh, long pants, so in the wintertime people routinely want to correct me about the kind of weather and how I should be dressing. The gestures that we use, these are folk ways, they're informal ways of and customs in which we can express ourselves. The religious fasting, these aren't laws but they are things that we would, ex we would adhere to. The kinds of cars that we buy or the color of car we prefer. Now mores, these are strongly held norms with a moral or ethical connotation that may or may not be violated, violated without serious consequences in a particular culture. Now they are more usually focused on sexual morality and what we call taboos. Incest would be an example of a taboo that would fit in the mores. And then lastly of course we mentioned previously was formal standardized norms that have been enacted by legislature and are enforced by formal sanctions or what we call laws. And these are all found within, if you will, this element of culture because the laws aren't the same across the world. They're unique to each culture and what we accept as normal, you know, law-abiding behavior isn't necessarily a universal standard across the world. So here's a, a graphic that looks at essentially codes of behavior. We have values which um, lead to the kinds of things that we call our norms. So our values sort of are the foundation, starting point by which we form our norms. Norms can be folkways, mores, which can also include taboos, and laws. 
Now this is what we're going to cover in our first in the first section of culture in week three. So now uh, you've got that. I hope you've done, and hope you've uh, enjoyed it, and hope you uh, have a chance to get through your textbook and get caught up on the material that will uh, help you prepare for the test coming up in what what is it week four I think or week five sorry I don't have my syllabus right in front of me so I hope this is going well for you I hope the semester is unfolding well and please enjoy yourself and thank you bye now